Hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kelly Guy. I'm the Director of Policy here at the Canadian Association of Social Workers, and I'm very happy to be moderating this webinar on social work services and the private payer landscape. But before I properly introduce your speaker for today, Suzanne LePage, I want to provide a little bit of context. So uh, trying to get social work services widely covered by employee insurance plans and by insurance plans generally has been one of uh, our big advocacy pushes here at CSW over the last, I would say, seven or so years. Um, and then we did do a survey in 2014, too, that found that, that less than half of private insurance plans that we surveyed included social work services. And of course, we also we get this question all the time from members, especially those of you that work in private practice. So we decided to ask Suzanne to present, to present for us. Um, we're really excited that she agreed to put this presentation together and to really bring us up to date on the issue and what the landscape's like in Canada right now. So just quickly, the housekeeping details you need. So how to access the recording of this later, where to download the slide deck, how to get your certificate of attendance, all of, all of that stuff is in the housekeeping widget popped up when you first logged on. I would also direct your attention to the resource widget on the left-hand side. Uh, we've popped a couple of resources on there, uh, like our brochure about social work and employee benefit plans, and also some information from our partner, the British Columbia Association of Social Workers. So that said, as for structure, we will definitely have time for questions, so please ask those anytime, uh, and even if there's some throughout, we can, we can take a pause to address some of those. So with that said, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker properly. Suzanne LePage uh, is going to be sharing her private payer expertise with us to really uh, educate us on how private health benefit plans are structured and how the coverage is determined. Her, ex uh, her experience includes working as the national manager of private health care with the pharmaceutical company Rush Canada. Before that, she worked in group benefits for several major Canadian insurers in a wide variety of roles for, for 20 years. So we're really happy she's here to provide us uh, with really an entry to this often confusing topic. Um, so with that said, I'm happy to pass the microphone over to Suzanne. Thank you, Sally, and welcome, everybody. I'm glad you were able to take some time out of your day. Um, I hope to share with you a little bit about demystifying how decisions about coverage are made in the insurance industry and uh, explain how things work and hopefully equip you to uh, be able to have discussions with your patients and insurers about coverage. So here's the overview of what I plan on covering today. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about how different uh, ways that social work is reimbursed, I'm going to explain a bit about how health insurance works. And believe it or not, health insurance is uh, uh, grounded in uh, group benefits tax guidelines, and so I need to explain those to you to make sure you understand that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about health care spending accounts because that's one way that you can be reimbursed. I'm also going to explain to you who all the different stakeholders are and how they influence each other in the market. And a little bit about, I call it the business of group insurance, which is how insurance companies make money. And then I'm going to do a narrow focus on how paramedical practitioners are covered under health benefits, how they're reimbursed under wellness and mental health programs, and employee assistance programs. I also thought it might be helpful towards the end to tell you just some of the hot topics. So what are the other things that are um, being discussed in the private payer market, just so you know where their head's at in terms of what's really um, keeping them up at night. And lastly, just uh, what I call best practices. Now, I have d questions and discussions at the end, but I did say to Sally that I'd be glad to take questions as we go along if it makes sense uh, in the context of what we're looking at at that point in time. So feel free through the chat to uh, ask questions and Sally will uh, moderate that. So with that, let's get started. So social workers are reimbursed in a couple of different ways in the insurance uh, under what we call the extended health benefits under a health care spending account, and under an employee assistance program. So there's three possible ways, and they're a little bit different. So extended health benefits, and I'll explain that in a little more detail, is when uh, an insurance company takes on the what they call takes on the risk to offer benefits to uh, a group plan, an employer plan. Where, uh, then we have something called a health care spending account, which I'll tell you a little bit more about. And in the insurance industry, it's called defined contribution because it's a set amount of money that's put aside by the employer for the employee. And finally, um, the employee assistance programs, which are under the category of employee wellness support. 
So these are three different ways that you might be reimbursed by private payers, and they all sort of have different mechanics associated with them. So I'm going to touch on all three as as we go along. But it's really important to understand that because uh, when you're talking with a patient or you're talking about reimbursement, there's many different ways that this can happen. So first, let's talk about private health insurance in Canada. So why would an employer offer benefit plans? And there's many reasons, as you can see here. So it can be employee recruitment and retention. It can be uh, to be competitive. They could be part of a union negotiation plan. But you might be surprised to know that the most common reason is it's tax effective. And I'm going to explain that to you in a minute. But what that really means is, is that um, if you offer someone an additional $1,000 in salary, you have to uh, uh, make sh they have to pay tax on that $1,000 and you have to give them a T4. In Canada, if you offer someone a benefit plan that follows the Revenue Canada guidelines, um, it's non-taxable. So they aren't taxed. So that $1,000 in benefits is much more valuable than that $1,000 in salary. In Quebec, the cost of a benefit plan paid by an employer is subject to provincial tax, but in the rest of Canada, both federally and provincially, it's non-taxable. So that's one of the big appeals of offering benefit plans in Canada. So I want to touch briefly on tax guidelines, and I mean, this kind of stuff can be dry, but I think it's important to know that this is the foundational principles of group benefits, and it will affect your practice. So um, when a group benefit plan follows uh, CRA rules, that's Canada Revenue Agency rules, they have to follow rules for, there's two things, and I'm going to cover both of them, a private health services plan and the medical expense tax credit and the employer pays for the employee benefits. The amount paid by the employer is a tax deduction to the employer's business, and except for Quebec, the employees don't have to pay tax. And so it does, um, if these guidelines are not followed, the employer's contribution wouldn't qualify for the tax deduction, and the employees would have to be t uh, taxed. And what that means is it's not if, – if, if they're offside at even one of the claims that they pay, it could um, put the whole plan offside. So if they happen to pay uh, for one um, expense that did not match those guidelines, uh, the, the whole plan could be taxable. So that's one of the reasons uh, insurance companies have to ensure that they're compliant and plan sponsors look to their insurance companies to make sure they're compliant. An example of where someone might not be compliant is when it would be a practitioner that doesn't meet Revenue Canada guidelines. And I'll go over that in a, in a slide or two. So a private health services plan under the Canada Revenue Agency is, is um, it's actually a, it's part of an act, and it basically says that uh, contributions that are made by an employer to a benefit plan are excluded from their income. And the other thing is, is that the coverage that is, um, is, is there has to be uh, otherwise qualified under the medical expense tax credit on your personal tax return. And when it comes to uh, the medical expense tax credit, um, uh, what they say is that a medical practitioner is a healthcare professional authorized by law to practice as a medical practitioner. And the medical practitioner guidelines vary province by province, so it's quite complex to ensure that everybody that they reimburse is covered. An example of where that would um, be a challenge um, in, uh, is in the province of Quebec, massage therapists don't have the same licensing, so it's a little bit more difficult, for example, to cover massage therapy in Quebec because there isn't uh, licensing as a medical practitioner. So this is all part of the insurance company's compliance to make sure that whoever they're paying for meets these criteria to make sure that the program stays on side under Canada Revenue Guidelines. So when we one of the ways that pay, uh, patients can pay for their expenses is under a healthcare spending account. Um, a healthcare spending account is an employer funded account. The amount that's in the account is determined by the employer. So sometimes they put in a fixed amount by employee class. So they might say salaried employees get $500 a year and unionized employees get $600 a year. Uh, they might do it a monthly deposit, an annual deposit. You might also have employees um, that have something called a flex benefit plan where they can pick from a few choices and uh, they get a budget in which they can spend um, and, and uh, they get to choose how much money goes into their healthcare spending account. 
Um, it can be used to reimburse medical and dental expenses um, that are determined by that Canada Revenue Agency guideline. Uh, employees cannot make their own deposits. That's one of the requirements for it to be an eligible health care spending account. It has to come from the employer. And any benefits that are paid under that health care spending account, again, are non-taxable. So the advantages of a health care spending account for an employer is that they can uh, reimburse health-related expenses with pre-tax dollars. They can cover a wide range of medical and dental benefits that might not be covered under a traditional health and benefit plan. Um, it also allows, if you have a dependent that's eligible uh, under Canada Revenue Agency as a dependent, so sometimes we see that with a handicapped uh, sibling, adult sibling, or we might see a grandmother that's financially dependent, she might be eligible. And then the, the most attractive option is that employees can choose how to use the deposits in their account. In order for the healthcare spending account to comply, comply with CRA, they have to do a couple things. They have to be structured like a private health services plan, have a medical expense tax credit, and there has to be something called an element of risk. And so that means that um, there has to be, uh, they call it the use it or lose it guideline. So what happens is, is you can either carry forward unused credits from one year to the next, or you can carry forward unpaid expenses from one year to the next. And an unpaid expense would be you had a, an expense from 2017 and uh, you didn't have any money in your account left over, you can bring it forward to 2018. But you can't do both. And the unused funds, if they're not used for a medical expense, they're re returned to the employer. So these are all the guidelines that have to be followed. You don't need to worry about this, you know, as you bill your clients, but, uh, but what it helps you understand is some of the rules of engagement as it relates to the money that might be available to them. So again, if any of these guidelines are not followed, uh, it, cannot be, it won't be a tax deduction for the employer and the employees will have to pay taxes. So again, it's up to the uh, insurance company or administrator who's managing the plan to make sure that all these guidelines are followed. You may have also heard something called a taxable spending account, and in reality, it's for everything else. So everything that's not eligible under the medical expense tax credit uh, that can be covered, so gym membership, weight loss programs, all these things that don't qualify under the Revenue Canada guidelines would be um, covered. It's not as regulated, and the benefits or deposits re become a taxable benefit. So they could use these dollars in a taxable spending account for services with you, but they also can be used for anything else. So it's really up to the uh, patient to decide how they want to spend that money. So when it comes to group benefit plans, group insurance is to cover expenses to treat a medical condition or an illness. So the concept of insurance, if you think about it, when you think about insurance for your car or your house, you're buying protection for an unexpected future risk or um, expense. So you, the unexpected event is that you get MS. The unexpected event is that uh, you need, your child needs braces. Um, anything that's a known event uh, or preventative technically can't be insured because it's not a uh, it's not a unexpected expense. It's 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 under it's known, and the same thing preventative treatments. Um, although they're important, they would not normally be covered under an insurance plan. So we're going to talk about wellness a little bit later. It's not that they're not valuable to the employer, but they would not necessarily be covered under a insurance plan. They would be covered under a wellness program. Um, the other thing that's important to know um, is that they're intended to wrap around government coverage. So what normally happens is that in a province or a hospital where government programs are available to patients, private plans don't pay because there's public coverage. So they tend to sort of uh, have those guidelines set up. Uh, an example of that would be um, uh, uh, in the in the drug world, you would have uh, your cancer drugs delivered in a hospital, therefore the hospital would pay for it, therefore it would not be available under the private plan. So let's talk a little bit about the insurance industry. I'm going to give you some facts about it, and then I'm going to share with you some of the stakeholders. So this information comes from the Life and Health Insurance Association. Uh, this is facts about their industry. So it talks a little bit about 
hum, uh, health benefit premiums that were paid in 2017 was close to $41 billion. And according to their statistics, 80% of working Canadians have some kind of benefit coverage. Uh, when they split out um, uh, how many people are covered, 25 million Canadians have some kind of extended health coverage. When we look at extended health, uh, the benefits, the claims they paid out equaled $32.5 billion in 2017. And as you can see, um, under the paramedical and vision, $3 billion were paid out in paramedical claims, which is where social workers fall. So who are the stakeholders in the industry and how do they interact with each other? So the first thing that if you leave with nothing else today, it's important to know that the plan sponsor, which is what the insurance calls them, the, per, the group or the person that pays for the benefits is the decision maker. Um, they're called a plan sponsor. They're often an employer, but sometimes they can be an association plan. Sometimes they can be like a multi-employer trust where you might have like the auto workers that come together as multi-employer trust. And they are the decision maker, so they decide what benefits they want to offer, how much they can afford, and they design the benefit plan. And we'll talk a little bit about different benefit plan designs. Uh, they typically um, uh, are concerned about the plan members that are their employees. So. Uh, they'll compare their benefit plan to other employers in a similar industry. So, for example, you'll see um, uh, law firms comparing themselves to other law firms. You wouldn't necessarily see a law firm comparing their benefits to an auto worker organization. So they tend to sort of make sure that they're competitive. If there's a union involved, sometimes the collective bargaining agreement with the union determines what benefits are covered, and so that drives the decision making. But as you can imagine, uh, a plan sponsor is busy, you know, making their uh, cars, uh, practicing law. They're doing whatever they need to do. So most of them hire what we call a benefit plan advisor, sometimes called a broker, sometimes called a consult benefits consultant. And really, they are uh, an independent advisor that uh, acts much like your financial planner or your um, your. your insurance broker for your car or your house, and they provide advice and counsel to plan sponsors about their benefit plan. They are selected, so they compete against each other to be the uh, advisor of choice for the employer, and they really are the guide. They help them determine, you know, what kind of benefit should I consider, and what are my, uh, what are my competitors doing, how much can I afford? They'll um, shop around, so to speak, to find out what the different insurers would charge them, and really are their trusted advisor in this world of benefits because they're focused on doing their core business, and so they look to an advisor to be their, uh, their expert, so to speak. Um, the plan advisors work uh, to facilitate insurance with the insurers, and so they might send a quote out, uh, request for quotation. So they'll say, here's the benefit plan design that employer ABC wants. They may send it to three or four uh, insurers to get a quote. And, and help the plan sponsor choose the insurance company that they would like to work with. In your world, you may also run across something called a health benefit manager. And what they are is they actually act as a conduit to allow direct billing uh, between um, the practitioner and the insurance company. And uh, some platforms for that are TELUS, uh, and Manulife, uh, Express Scripts Canada, where they um, uh, they facilitate real time what we call real time adjudication of claims. It's very common with chiropractors and uh, vision care and um, uh, uh, massage therapy, for example, where they can do real time adjudication. So these are all the stakeholders, and so definitely it's important to know these as we move forward because they all influence, as you can imagine. Uh, the coverage that's available. So I'm going to talk briefly about the business of group insurance. And that's really just helping you understand how the insurance companies make decisions and what drives their, their, um, their business. So I used to work for an ins different insurers for a number of years, and it might surprise you to know that Although health and dental benefits account for a higher proportion of the business, so the dollars that are coming in the door, because you can imagine they have a lot of claims for health and dental, they actually have a much lower impact on insurer's net income. 
And their life and disability benefits, although it's a smaller portion of the business coming for the door, it has a much more significant impact on the insurer's net income. So again, it just go, it shows you a little bit about where their focus might be as an, as an organization. The challenge in working in an insurance business is to determine the right premium. And when I say the right premium, they actually have to figure out um, how to kick the rates low enough to be competitive. So as you imagine, Manulife's competing with Sun Life, Sun Life's competing with Great West Life to win the business. So they have to be low enough to um, be competitive, but high enough to be profitable. Because at the end of the day, what actuaries and underwriters do is they try to predict the risk. And so they say, if I expect this group's claims to equal $200,000 a year, I've got to charge them that much in premium to, pay that, to be able to pay those. Yet they also have to compete with the other insurance companies and make sure they're low enough. So I like to call it the price is right because they have to figure out how to balance those two things out to make sure that they don't lose money in managing the benefit plans they take on. When you think about the plan sponsor, um, the challenge with them is the benefit of access to treatments, is, it, whether it be drugs or paramedical or anything else, is very abstract because it's reduced to a line item in an annual renewal report. Uh, because of privacy regulations, they don't know who's claiming and more importantly, how they're benefiting from the treatment they receive. So whether, again, it's a practitioner, whether it's um, uh, counseling, whether it's uh, drugs, is that they know that they're paying for these because they, they have a, a line item cost that comes through, but there's no one to tell them that, you know, we were able to, um, you know, prevent lost work days or make sure they're more productive or avoided a disability because none of that information is made available to them. And then, unfortunately, the plan member, the person who's benefiting from the benefits, is really often very reluctant to share their diagnosis or the benefit of their treatment with their employer. They don't want them to know, hey, I'm the one with the issues. I'm the one who's costing you money because they're afraid that that could work against them. So unfortunately, um, it, for the plan sponsor, it really is an abstract concept. So I'm going to now talk about how paramedical practitioners fit in with the health benefits. But Sally, I'm just going to pause to see if you have any questions so far before I move on. Yeah, so we, we have a couple that I think might be addressed later that are more about how, they're more about how as social workers we can advocate to have our services be understood as, uh, you know, needed and as relevant to psychology, for instance, um, sure. and how to make yeah, sure that will. insurance providers and employers know that. Yeah, so yeah, we will get to that. So thanks, we'll hold off on those ones. Okay, yeah, yeah, I thought so maybe. Yeah. Okay, okay, great. So now I'm going to take a, a focus on paramedical practitioners. And um, the first thing to note is that there's some, I want to, I, where I possible, I try to share research or, or commentary that comes right from this insurance industry. And a new report uh, that came out yesterday I thought was very interesting. Uh, it's told us that although plan sponsors estimate that 29% of their workforce has a chronic disease, in actual fact, 58% of the plan members report that they've been told they have a chronic disease. So there's a huge gap in understanding uh, the, the health of their workforce. When they were surveyed and asked for their, their what chronic condition they have in order of um, in terms of numbers, the second most common chronic condition that they had was something related to mental illness. So it could be such as depression or anxiety. And uh, those uh, that were um, interviewed and for the survey said that if they had a mental illness, 72% indicated that it negatively impacted or affected their work. Um, I was the actual cost of a benefit plan is private between an employer and the insurance company, but I did ask some benefit plan advisors that I know, and they gave me a couple of examples of some clients they had. And what they said is that when you look at the total dollars that they spend on their benefits, 40% or 39% was spended, spent on the extended health benefit. And when we looked at the breakdown, drugs was the, most, the biggest part of that pie, but 22% of that extended health, benef extended health care plan was uh, attributed to paramedical practitioners. And then an, another piece of information that came from this recent survey is that 53% of the plan members that were surveyed said they'd claimed 
uh, a claim for paramedical services in the last year. And according, those people who did make a claim, they actually made 8.1 claims in a year. So they come very, very close behind prescription drugs. When we look at any kind of publication or discussion regarding paramedical use, um, uh, we do hear that there's a growing popularity in a, a treatment by paramedical practitioners. This came from Medivy. Uh, a benefit plan advisor said that paramedicals represent 15 and 25 between 15 and 25 of healthcare claims, and it's the fastest growing category. In terms of, I thought this was very interesting. So when we look at what's paid out of pocket and what's paid by the private plan. So as you, you may know, private plans often have like an 80-20 split. So 80% is paid by the private plan, 20% is paid out of pocket. When we look at some of the different benefit lines, we can see here that when it comes to paramedical, um, uh, much more is paid out of pocket than something like drugs or dental. So it is costing patients more out of their own pocket. Now there's some good news. Uh, we have some organizations that have increased their coverage. So Manulife, for their own employees last year, increased employee coverage for mental health treatment to $10,000 a year. So it's for their own employees. Uh, the employers that they cover will have to choose to do this on their own. And it does include a broad range of practitioners, including the social workers. Uh, Great West Life uh, increased their employee coverage uh, to $5,000 a year. And Cooperatives Insurance, which is a smaller player, also extended their coverage to $5,000 a year. So they are really setting the standard in terms of uh, their own organizations to, to lead the way to ensure that uh, their employees have access to the treatment they need. Um, this was an interesting stat that came out last year uh, in something called the Sanofi Healthcare Survey. Sanofi is a drug company, and they publish this survey every year for the last 20 years, and they talk to people about their benefit and their benefits in their health. And what they ask them is, what would you like increased coverage for? So what benefits would you like to see improved? And what would you be willing to trade off in order to get those improvements? So when people wanted increases in their dental care services, and major dental would be things like crowns and, um, and, and that kind of thing, they would be 60% of them would be willing to trade off paramedical services. For those that wanted increase in vision care coverage, 53% would be willing to trade off their paramedical services. And those that wanted increased paramedical services said, okay, 35% said, I'll give up, I'll trade off major dental. And 32% said, hey, I'll trade off vision care. So there are some people that would be willing to trade off other benefits to get access to paramedical services. So what's dri uh, driving the rising demand? There was an interesting article that was published last year because there is a growing demand and, and ultimately a growing cost. Um, what um, this, this article talked about is that paramedical services ranked second behind prescription medications and the number of claims. And um, one of the insurers said that we have to be vigilant about paramedical uh, services because they're, they're not a big problem right now, but they're concerned that there isn't a least controlled component in group insurance plans. And when they say least controlled, they mean things like audit, things like verifying claims. So in some cases, let's say when it comes to drugs, they have to, uh, they can investigate real time uh, the, the drug claim because all the information is submitted and can be verified at the, at the point of um, payment. Less rigor is put around paramedical services. Um, although they also do say that some stakeholders, you know, question the relevance of paramedical uh, services, although the employees note, uh, the note was that the employees view these services as valuable. However, um, some paramedical services do not necessarily have a clearly demonstrated uh, therapeutic value but are still prized by employees. So this is just, um, I included this because it gives you a flavor of how th these are viewed by the people in the insurance industry. Um, the, the, the one comment here that I really I highlighted in red is that the direct link between med paramedical care and the reduction in absenteeism or increased productivity can be difficult to quantify. And so this is something that more and more as we're trying to, uh, as private payers are trying to really look closely at the dollars they spend, they want to make sure they're getting the return on investment. 
So you need to think about all these things when we're going to talk about how to approach the, the, the organizations. Um, many employers struggle with the category of paramedical, especially if they face large increases year after year. And so then again, this talked a little bit about why the interest in paramedicals is growing. And so this is just some examples of why interest in the overall paramedicals field is growing. And again, this highlights the, the thing that uh, is that the individual decision about including or excluding and how much is a decision that's made. And I'll explain how that works a little bit uh, when I get further into my presentation. Oh, it's right here. Sorry about that. So the practitioner design can be um, set up in such a way that it's either per certificate or for, for uh, the insured. So in the example in the picture I show below, that family that's there below represent one certificate. So the, one of those parents works for the employer. So that's one certificate. And then, but under that certificate, there are five people insured: the mother, the father, and the three children. So the plan design could be set up as per certificate per practitioner. So they could say, for the certificate, we allow $500 per practitioner in a year. You could also have per insured, so each family member gets $500 per practitioner per year. So that would mean $5 for chiropractic, $500 for chiropractic, $500 for social work, $500 for physio, so it breaks down that way. What's more common um, would be uh, per certificate or per insured where all practitioners are combined. So they might say, we offer $500 for all the paramedical practitioners, and the employee gets to choose how they spend those dollars. So they could do them all in massage, they can do them all in physio, they can do them all in social work or psychology, but it's up to them to use the money as they see fit. And then sometimes what they have is they have built in where they'll say, we'll pay $50 towards a visit. And so the idea is that then they would expect the employee to pay the difference. So those are some of the more common plan designs. And what happens is when an insurance company gets the request from the benefit plan advisor for to quote on the benefits, nine times out of ten, that decision has already been made. So it's almost like an order. They say, I'm ordering up a design that looks like this, and the insurance company comes up with the rate. And so um, Although a lot of us think that the insurance companies decide coverage, they're very much almost like a grocery store where they have all the different coverage options on their shelf, and the advisor on behalf of the employer comes in and says, this is what I want you to quote on. And so uh, that's why you'll see a wide variety of coverage between um, different um, um, different people. So just because you had a patient with green shield in the morning who had a certain type of coverage and you have a green shield patient in the afternoon, their coverage can be completely different. And that's not because green shield is different. It's because each employer has designed the plan that meets their needs. And so um, this, these are the options that they have chosen. Now, there's something else that you need to be aware of when it comes to billing, and this is something called reasonable and customary fees. And what this happens, happens with everything from um, dentists, and it comes with vision, and it comes with all different types of pharmacists, is that um, they try to come up with a range of fees that's reasonable and customary in each province. And so they try to come up, if there's a fee guide, they'll look at the fee guide. If not, they'll look at what sort of the middle ground in terms of the fees in that province. And um, they'll use these to determine um, how they price the benefit plan and how they will pay claims. Most time the expenses that are claimed fall within this reasonable and customary fee range, but if they charge more, the plan member is uh, responsible for the cost. So I'll try, I have an example here. So let's say here, um, this amount in this green bar represents what you as a practitioner would bill uh, the patient or the insurance company for the services. What they'll do is they'll compare what you've billed to what they consider is reasonable and customary, or R and C, in the province in which you operate. And in this particular example, you can see there's a small portion that uh, is not that is over and above the reasonable and customary amount. And then on top of that, then you actually have what I call the plan design, where it says, 
okay, we will pay up to 80% of what's reasonable and customary. And so what could happen is is that you have a portion of the cost that is not payable by the plan, a portion that's what we call the copay that the patient has to pay, and we also have a portion that was over and above the reasonable and customary amount. Um, an example I can give you that, that, that I can relate to is um, if I go to my local physiotherapy, uh, my local uh, massage therapy clinic, I live in Ontario, uh, they charge me, let's say, $70 for a massage, and that falls within the reasonable customary. If I'm away with a friend and we're at a, at a, a hotel which has a spa, they also have licensed uh, massage therapists, but instead of charging $70 for a massage, they might charge 120 I'm still only allowed 70, and then I would have to make up that difference out of my pocket. And so those are built into the plans to make sure that what's being charged is reasonable for that plan and helps protect the plan sponsor's benefit costs. Now, I also mentioned that there is uh, wellness and mental health coverage. That includes coverage sometimes for social workers. So the first thing is, is that um, 49% of plan sponsors with wellness programs say that they offer training to help managers recognize and respond to signs of depression or other mental illness in the workplace. And so sometimes this is called mental health first aid. Uh, it's a specialized type of training, and that came out of the recent uh, Sanofi survey. Um, the other thing that came out of this survey is that when they look at how they're spending their wellness dollars, what we can see there is out of the wellness dollars, 24% of those wellness dollars uh, are resources, 24% uh, go towards emotional and mental health. What's interesting, though, is that when we talk about how they're going to increase those resources in the next five years, 50% of them said over the next five years that they're going to increase investing more resources in the area of emotional and mental health. So they definitely see some value in doing that. Employee assistance programs are completely separate from the extended health benefit insurance, but are another way that social workers might be reimbursed. So an employee assistance program generally offers what we could call traditional counseling. Um, it, uh, it could be face-to-face -face counseling. Can, it's often short-term and reactive. Um, they provide resources for things like uh, personal emotional problems, marriage difficulty, uh, addiction stress. Uh, according to this uh, this article, that 60% uh, of the calls had to do with these top five areas, so relationship, personal, workplace, depression, and anxiety. Um, although nowadays sometimes the employee assistance programs offer additional services such as legal and financial help, uh, second opinion on medical issues, um, disability issues, et cetera. So sometimes the companies that are offering these programs have expanded the scope of services that they offer employers. Um, when the survey, Sanofi survey looked in uh, 2016, they looked at how employees view EAPs and they said 11% of them use the EAP and 39% um, of them who use them rated them uh, excellent or very good. Uh, and then when they asked employees how they value their EAP benefit relative to all the other benefits, uh, it came in last in terms of 60% is saying that it was a, a somewhat or very important component of their benefit plan. You can see how it ranks here. Um, this, uh, in, an employer who was interviewed about their plan, I thought this was interesting to help you understand, is that uh, they pay $2.30 per employee per month regardless of whether the employees use it or not. And that's really almost like an insurance plan. They're paying a premium that will help cover the cost for the portion of the employees that use it. And according to their uh, reports, they got that 17% of their employees use their EAP. And they felt they were a worthwhile investment because it was such a small cost for their business based on the return they would get from the service. So in terms of benefit hot topics, what are other things that are being talked about in the insurance industry? Some, uh, I would say that the main topics that are keeping them up at night are the cost of specialty medications that are really driving the overall extended health benefit, uh, biologic and biosimilar drugs, orphan drugs for rare diseases. Um, we're going through some major drug pricing reform at the federal level uh, that could significantly impact private plans. 
the impact of mental health on employees in terms of their ability to do their work, to avoid a disability claim, that's a very high priority. Uh, disability management, so managing people who are gone on disability and getting them back to work. Retirement benefits as a big portion of where they spend their time. Medical marijuana is a big focus, although many plans already cover medical mar or may cover some medical marijuana. The concern about how recreational marijuana factors in is, is becoming top of mind, and the opioid epidemic is having an impact. So the, uh, these are the things that if you go to conferences or you read employee benefit publications, these are the things that are being talked about the most. So what are best practices as it relates to uh, dealing with um, uh, employee benefit plans? Um, I think it's really important that uh, whoever is advocating for coverage demonstrate the value of the services as it relates to the workplace. And so that can be come in the form of a testimonial, right? So an example of how a patient who had access to your services benefited from it and how that affected their ability to be productive, to avoid a, dis uh, a short or long-term disability. Looking at research and evidence that exists that's uh, in peer-reviewed uh, 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 journals that it can show the benefit of the treatment and showing the evidence to support that. Um, I think it's really important that we think about targeting the benefit plan advisor for the employer. They're really a surrogate. They are the trusted and primary source of information, and they really are the ones that help provide plan sponsors with design recommendations. So those, you know, this employer who's busy building auto parts, he sort of says, okay, what do you think I should cover? What, what are other people doing with paramedical practitioners? And often they're the ones that will drive the request back to the insurer for the coverage. And as I said, the insurance companies often have a wide variety of practitioners and plans that they offer, and they really just really provide what they think, uh, they provide what the client requests in a quote. Um, the other thing I often mention just to every, every industry I speak to is that you also have to consider the reputational impact of member activities. If someone's had a bad experience with a, uh, a practitioner in, in your association, then sometimes that can have an impact overall on how they view the practice. And so it's always important to think about making sure that, um, that you know, everybody's professional and ethical and, how, and consider how that impacts the whole uh, industry. So I've covered a lot of ground, and I really would love to hear what you would like to know about and ask me questions so I can uh, meet your needs here today. So Sally, I'm going to flip it back to you so you can tell me what people would like to talk about. Right. Okay. Thank you so much, Suzanne. That was, I think, probably new for a lot of us, like the, those kinds of details, getting us thinking about how and why these plans are developed in the way that they have uh, and how we, you know, on our end can hopefully change that. So I'm gonna, I'll go right back to the to the first question I sort of posed to you, um, ask it very deliberately, and I'll ask it in the same way that it was originally written because it is written well. But it goes like this. So really the question I have is how can we as social workers involved in clinical practice get more insurance companies to consider us as equals to psychologists? It appears like we're getting more and more marginalized when our clinical skills are often superior to those offered by psychologists. So coming back to that point, when I was doing the research for this presentation, um, a lot of the plans that I saw did include social workers. And so one of the things is, is, is the question I would ask back to the group, are you finding that when you do a specific inquiry or the patient does an inquiry, they say they're covered for psychology but they're not covered for social workers? Like are you getting that direct response or is it that just, they just don't have paramedical coverage in general? I, th I mean, I, without looking at what the audience isn't saying anything r about that right now, but yeah. our experience here at CSW, obviously we field a lot of calls from people, and it could be kind of like a confirmation bias thing where um, the people that call in to ask for help on this are the ones that are finding their clients aren't covered, and the ones mm -hmm. that, you know, their clients do have coverage, they're not calling us to to ask for help, right? So mm -hmm. there's def it's definitely still an issue. How big of an issue it is in terms of percentages, I don't know. But it's very good to hear from you that you're finding that, that many, many have it. So that's nice. Yeah, so when I did my research, especially when I looked at the insurance companies who are adding coverage for their own employees, uh, like all of them included social workers. And as I said, I, I asked a few, quite a few benefit plan advisors. And, like, yeah, like they, if they cover paramedical and if they cover 
psychologists they often they often cover social workers. So uh, I guess what I what you'd want to dig down a little bit deeper, Sally, as an organization, is that is it that the patients don't specifically exclude social work have their coverage exclude social workers, or just that they've exhausted their coverage, or they just don't have paramedicals at all? Because I think that's a real nuance that we'd have to get at. And I said my my research was not exhaustive at all. It was it was very anecdotal. Um, but I did, as I said, inquire on a few cases, and almost all of them came up and said they're equally covered. Uh, so we'd have to do a little digging on that to find out a little bit more. Right. So should so like maybe that means that our advocacy could be more centered around generally getting paramedical coverage for people if that basket sort of normally includes psychologists and social workers versus pushing for social work specifically if that is often already combined. Um, right. So, so I think it would take a little digging to to explore that a little bit more, uh, to right. to a little more rigor about it. And so, um, and that sort of was not in the scope of what I was doing for today. But I definitely think it's worth verifying that to to clarify that. No, that's. I mean, definitely, that's a just a really interesting line of inquiry for us uh, to look at here because. I'll, this is also for the audience who are working, you know, uh, often in private practice and in, in clinical settings, and also, you know, selfishly or not selfishly for our work here at uh, CSW in terms of this same question on an organizational level, right? Um, yeah. I have I have more questions though. I'm I'm ready. Good. I have, good. Um, let's go. We have lots. Let's, of let's go. Yeah. No. <laughs> we have. Uh, <laughs> someone says, how should we go about pushing for these changes? It seems like a lot of the surveys are of clients but we can't very well ask our clients to come forward and talk about their mental health needs. That's kind of hmm. a comment question. Yeah, and so coming back to um, what I just mentioned uh, before is I think sometimes is, um, and this happens also just so you know in, in, in drug benefits where if someone needs a high cost drug but they don't want the employer to know that they, they need that drug, right? Because they might, you know, oh, I might miss out on a promotion, I might, you know, I might get fired, so they're concerned about that. And that's where we look at the advocacy groups in terms of building up that uh, that sort of area of evidence to sort of say, uh, finding out uh, on behalf, you know, you know, going to like a Green Shield or going to a, a Great West Life and saying, uh, do you cover social workers or not? Um, the other thing that you can do is that the employee can um, uh, uh, advocate confidentially on their own behalf to the insurance company so they don't have to go through the employer. So, you know, the line of questioning that, you know, if we think about what I just said is you could say, hi, I'm just calling to find out, um, I, you know, I had my claim for a social worker declined. Is it because social workers aren't covered or is it because I just don't have any coverage? Like, you know, like, so thinking about what you could look at, Sally, is creating sort of a how to how to navigate your own coverage, right? So that they can call the one eight hundred number, which is a confidential inquiry, and they can just say, "Am I covered? Am I covered for a social worker?" And trying to determine just that: is it because social workers are excluded, or they've maxed out on their benefit, or they just don't have paramedicals at all? So there's sort of a, a triage that they can do uh, to figure out for themselves without having to involve their employer. Right. I don't know if that well, addresses that's, that's the question, Sally, and but I think be... that does. A way that we that we move forward here at CSW. Yeah, I've seen um, the, some. Sorry, I was just going to say I've seen some other um, uh, uh, advocacy organizations do that, like creating a little pamphlet or something. Understanding your insurance, what questions should you ask? Those kinds of things. Right. Yeah. Like uh, client targeted versus. So what we have been doing. So um, our mm -hmm. advocacy on this, like organizationally at the Canadian Association of Social Workers, has been employer driven. So by that I mean we have pamphlets and brochures for employers to mm -hmm. explain to them our value um, mm -hmm. and sort of asking them or you know making them aware of, of our value so that they just decide to add those services to their employee benefit plans to you know attract and retain employees. So with what you know is that it like so I guess I'm hearing that we need maybe a three-pronged approach. So maybe we keep doing that, and then we also create a toolkit for the clients themselves to help understand better. Sure, I think so. And then the other target could be the benefit plan advisors rather than the plan sponsors, because there's so many plan sponsors. 
and so many of them are involved day in and day out in their production. So I, I, I did an advisory board with plan advisors last week, and one of the things they said is that they, they only get to visit their clients twice a year, but they they have to cover everything in that in those discussions about the benefit plan. So I, I think it would be hard necessarily for you to target plan sponsors, but the advisors, because they're trusted, they are the ones that can they can communicate the value. So if you could if you can communicate to the plan advisors that there's value in social work, then they can advocate to make sure that those employers add them. So that's another way of reaching them is is sharing with them the value of the um of of adding social work. But again, I think there maybe uh, as I said coming back a few steps like I mentioned before is determining first of all that there is indeed, you know, lack of uh, equity between the two and determining that more closely so that as I said is it just that we need more paramedical services or specifically adding in social work. Right. Yeah. I have um I've got a, I've got a long line of questions here. I'm going to just ask but one that's very going. sort of um this sort of specific, and they're asking, do you find that there's a difference in coverage in terms of a master's of social work versus a bachelor of social work? So whether it's being the services are being offered by a ma uh, master or bachelor level, and I'm, I, I'll get. You. Do you know anything about that? Not off the top of my head, no. Okay, I I, I usually see the you word, the expert, but I think I can maybe answer that. That yeah. as far as everything I've seen in terms of our like, coverage for social work services. It's just been delineated registered social worker. It hasn't said That's what I've seen, too. You took the words right out of my mouth. It just says registered social worker. So if you're licensed in the province and considered right. a licensed practitioner, then you're covered. But I don't know for sure. So I don't want to say 100%. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that is um, – That's a, I, I just wanted to cover it because I got a few questions about it, but I, that was mm -hmm. my impression. Um, next is kind of a philosophical question here. If you're ready for that. Okay. Um, it's a, she says, you mentioned that insurance plans don't cover preventative things, and yet preventative care will help reduce costs to the employer, like by avoiding a disability claim. Is there a way we can change this? Is this likely to change? That's the question. So I want to be clear. Under the insurance plan, they don't cover preventative because insurance, it's just like your insurance for your car doesn't pay for oil changes, right? doesn't right. mean that oil changes aren't a good investment. It's just insurance is really you're paying a premium for an unexpected risk. But if you remember later on in my presentation, I talked about employee wellness programs, and I maybe didn't get into that in enough detail. Employers do lots of uh, wellness programs that they do pay for. They're just not covered under the, insur the health insurance because it's, it's exactly that. It's preventative. So they might do, um, you know, uh, uh, they might do, um, I don't want to call it meditation, but they might do, you know, different things in the workplace that they know have value in terms of employees' health, and so they'll pay for them. They're just not at what we call an insurable risk. So they do value, most of them value these pro different types of programs. It's just uh, when you think about what we call traditional insurance, you can't put a, a price tag on a risk of wellness. Wellness is just an investment, which is, just falls in a different line item in terms of how an organization runs their business. Do you think okay, that no, answers think the that, question, Sally? Clear, I think. Um, yeah. This is a very practical question, but I think a very important one since we've talked a lot about plan, envir uh, plan advisors. How do, you re how do we reach plan advisors? Who oh, are they? Where so are they? <laughs> so they're all over the place. So I uh, I know a lot of them because I present at conferences and I write articles and publications that they read. But, you know, there are people that are a one-man shop, right, Who who's just an independent plan advisor and has 50, 60 clients. And then there's firms that have 50, 60 people working for them in the firm. So, um, you know, uh, they're just people that are in the community and um, – and so, as I said, if there's different events they go to, there's different publications they read, and they um, and they also are looking for uh, courses and programs where they um, get continuing education credits. So oftentimes they attend events. So, you know, if that's something that you wanted to reach as an organization, we could take that offline, and I can tell you different ways that people have events where they can reach out. I'm, for example, doing. Um, you know, total disclosure, I was participating in a study uh, uh, in Canada on obesity in the workplace, and we're presenting the results to an event with 20 to 30 plan advisors next week. 
So um, they do come out uh, to different things like that, but they it is a challenge to reach them, but it's not as challenging as it is to go call an individual employer. So it's just um, reaching them at a different level. Right, yeah, I know, like a different way of targeting. I mean, that's yeah. super useful, I think, for all of us in the sense that mm -hmm. I – did not even know that that was a job title that we should be considering for targeting. So that's yeah. very, very helpful. Um, this is a question about, well, I guess I'll just read it. It's, um, we have learned in the past that insurance companies don't keep track of how many clients ask for social work coverage when it's not part of the plan. Can Is there a way that we could make that change happen, that they would be required to keep track of uh, requests? Well, so coming back to the to the original part is that um, an insurance companies can also show social work coverage. It's up to the employer to ask. So it actually would be up to the employer to keep track right. of those requests, right? So, uh, and because the inquiry to the insurance company is confidential, so if I called today to talk, my former employer and I called Manulife, it wouldn't be right for me to to share that information that, you know, um, I've had inquiries. So, no, you really have to advocate to your employer to add that coverage to it because it's the insurer's role is not to do a feedback loop and say, uh, you know, I got 20 inquiries on this last year on behalf of your employees. Because you've got to imagine we had hundreds of thousands of plans at an insurance company and then millions of plan members. And so that feedback loop does not exist today, whether it be for drugs or any kind of services, right, is that – Right. The call centers just aren't equipped to do that. And as I said, you really need to advocate to the employer themselves because they ultimately made the decision, probably on the recommendation of their plan's advisor. Okay. No, that's very helpful. I have um, – this is this is British Columbia specific, but I've gotten – it's come up four times, so I want to ask it. And okay. it's, you might not know the answer, but maybe you can reflect on, on how this situation happens. So, so a bunch of BC social workers are saying that um, – Often they have encountered that in BC, clinical counselors, so a different designation, like registered clinical counselors, are covered under most insurance plans, but social, work, social workers are excluded. And so how, like, how did that happen, that these sort of similar services with social workers, you know, arguably being um, more, better regulated and more accountable, are, are not included? Okay, so I guess, so every insurance company offers benefits in BC, right? Like they all have BC offices and BC insurance. And I guess my question would be, uh, the biggest insurer in, in, in BC would be uh, Pacific Blue Cross, but although Manulife and Great West Life and Green Shield, they all offer benefits in BC. If there's something uniquely happening in BC, I sometimes wonder, just my guess out loud would be, is the licensing different in terms of a registered practitioner? It doesn't seem right. Like, I mean, I, I assume that you have to get licensed as a social worker in the province of BC. Would that be correct, Sally, or do you know? Yeah, you do indeed, yeah. Yeah. Because remember, I thought, like, I, I looked to the example, if I mentioned earlier about Quebec, M massage therapy is a great example because there isn't professional licensing. It's different in Quebec than the rest of Canada. So I really don't know without, uh, you know, finding out a little bit more. And as I said, is it every single carrier? Because, for example, if they cover registered social workers in Ontario, I can't imagine why Manulife would not cover registered social workers in BC, right? So as I said, I think I'd need a little more information to be able to sort that out. And again, Sally, we might have to take that offline. Right. No, no, no. Definitely, definitely appreciate that. And I think that everyone appreciates us kind of, you know, chatting and, and working through this as, as best we can because this is not CSW's wheelhouse, and yet we are so concerned about it and so want to make improvements on it and, and need to know where to start and, and how to make those changes. Mm -hmm. so that actually is related to another question that came up, um, which is from the north. So in northern, in parts of northern Canada, we, we actually don't have social work regulation. So there is not a social work licensing body um, to, to regulate or to register people. And so someone asked, um, I work in the north, and I find that I that social work services have never been covered, but that that there are, she framed framed it as um, mental health services that are available, and then that is not further delineated. Is that something that you've come up across that that's a way of getting around a lack of licensure? 
Uh, it's hard to say without the specifics. Again, so remember I talked in an extended health benefit plan, in order for the benefit to be non-taxable, it has to be a licensed medical practitioner in the province in which they, they cover. So that for if, it, if there's no licensing in that province, then they can't fit into that Canada Revenue Agency criteria. But as I mentioned earlier, there are other services like employee assistance plans and other wellness components where they just say, we want to offer wellness services in mental health. And in those cases, they aren't bound by the same guidelines because it's not an insurance law uh, uh, compliance issue. So that's potentially how it could be handled, right, is that it's not under the the extended health benefits where premiums are charged, but under that other umbrella called um, uh, employee wellness. I'm going to go back okay. to... Um, so in, in terms of the employee wellness, we, we have some questions about that versus um, versus in straight insurance. Are there also plan, so does this category of plan advisors also exist for these wellness programs? Yeah, in some cases. So usually they are uh, what I would call much bigger, uh, uh, much bigger employers and much bigger firms. But yes, there are people... Uh, there's benefit plan advisor firms, usually for large, large employers, where they have um, one advisor that I would call like the quarterback. So let's say GM, for example. So GM has a benefit plan advisor, but almost like a law firm. They have a specialist back at the office, a specialist who deals in drugs, a specialist that deals in wellness, a specialist that deals in um, pension plans, and because this one person can't be an expert in all these areas. So what they have to do is they have a team behind them, almost like a law firm that specializes in it. And these, and, and coming back to the idea of where you reach these people, there is a wide variety of what I call um, employee health, employee wellness conferences where wellness people come together. So there's one in the fall every year where these are the people that deal in wellness either at the organization. So there might be someone who's in charge of wellness programs at GM, for example. And then the, the people who are in that industry that consult or support those employers attend these as well. So there is sort of a, a, sort of a, a world of um, uh, wellness, but that's separate and distinct from the insurance benefits that we talked about. And that's why I think, Sally, can you see this slide again, the social worker reimbursement? Yep, yep, we're on it, yep. Yeah, so the whole idea is that they almost sort of fit, uh, it would almost be another another uh, rectangle that would sort of say wellness. And so, and wellness means a lot of things to a lot of people. Wellness to some people means doing a Weight Watchers at work. And then others mm -hmm. mean having a gym in, at work. And like, so wellness means a lot of different things to different people. But there are experts in this area that look at the big picture. And then there's right. actually even a more detailed, there are people that focus on mental health in the workplace and are even more specialized area. But they're few and far between because there's not a lot of big employers in Canada, right? Like if you're a small 100 yeah. man, 100 person company, you, you, you can't afford or it's not in your, 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 your focus to have a, a wellness person, you know, in the workplace or even think about right. wellness. Yeah, no, it's, it's so interesting. I I'm going to read um, like a comment question from an audience member just so that I capture all of it because it's very passionate. Um, and they say, oftentimes the EAP benefits provided by big governmental agencies are substandard and have been done that way to save money. They also pay practitioners very little to provide these benefits. How can we have these large governmental agencies like, a, like Health allow their members to go to uh, private and good quality practitioners? And then they say, this is probably a union issue. So when I don't know of any government agencies that employ, offer employee assistance programs. Uh, one of the big companies actually was founded by Bill Murnau, who happens to be the Minister of Finance, but he's not involved anymore. He's divested of it. But most of these are private firms that sell services to employers. And so they are companies that you can sign a contract with, right? And so they recruit local practitioners, um, you know, um, Morneau Chappelle is one of these companies, and they have a little local office in my neighborhood, and they subcontract practitioners to provide their services. So I would suggest taking it up with the suppliers that um, that offer these services and, and have that discussion with them. There's not that many of them in Canada, so it would be manageable for you to, to meet with them and discuss this with them. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So... 
I think there's two people who are looking for just for some clarification around some of your sort of advice about how we should go about inspiring these changes. And they're just looking for clarity around the fact that you said um, an option for people is to advocate confidentially to the insurance providers about what we about what they need and that they would want social work. But then you also said that there was no feedback loop. So just looking for maybe we just misunderstood. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So how I was imagining, let me use myself as an example, right? And so I want to find out what coverage I have, right? So the idea is is that I uh, – so the, the question I was addressing was the idea that um, uh, – let's say I submitted a social work claim and it wasn't paid, and I can go back and find out, is it not being paid or am I not covered because you don't cover social workers, or is it because I just don't have any paramedical coverage in general? So it's the idea of finding out specifically what the problem is, right? So, uh, you know, that sort of identifying why it is that I don't have coverage. So it's me investigating that. Now, in terms of advocacy, I would have to then, if I wanted to make to say something, I would have to go to my employer and say something, right? And I'd have to say, hey, I would like access to these services. I don't have them. So you would have to disclose. But coming back to advocacy for you as an organization is um, saying, you know, can you determine if, in case, if it is indeed the case that you guys are being excluded as a practitioner or is it just that the coverage isn't really great for paramedical practitioners in general? Right. Needing to make so that. It's, so those are the two nuances. One is just how can you equip the patient to ask better questions, right? You know, because as I said, some of these paramedical, some don't have paramedical programs at all, or some of them aren't very good, right? They don't cover yeah. a lot. And so is right. that the problem, or is it the fact that your particular practice is being excluded in those list of, of practitioners? Those are very different questions. Or right. else maybe they've used all their money on, on uh, massage therapy, and that's why there's no money left. Right. Yeah, no, there's so many potential nuances to why to why and how that's happening. Um, I have a, another question to kind of about the, I guess maybe the future of the industry or, or the future of the, this sort of landscape, which is that, so have you seen um, a growth in demand for wellness plans versus straight insurance, or is, is that something that's been happening? So they tend to go, uh, I, I would say that the awareness of the importance of wellness and how it can contribute to the organization, uh, either by employee engagement or improving employee health, tends to happen at the larger company level. And as I said before, I don't have the numbers at my fingertips, but there are very few really large companies. But those, there are lots that are acknowledging that that's important. Um, but they're, in general speaking, the, most of the Canadian population works for a small employer who just doesn't have the bandwidth to sort of look at that um, right. as closely as they would like. So, you know, it's not that they're not convinced that wellness is great. Like, the owner might, you know, um, play tennis and jog, but the fact that he just, you know, he's only got so much time in his day to sort of look at a wellness program for his employees, right? So, um I would say there's definitely growing interest of understanding it, but the ability to execute is is mm -hmm. sometimes difficult. Right. Yeah, yeah, the resources. Yeah. Um, so, um, there's one other thing. Can I just comment on one other thing, Sally, that came to mind? Is, yes, yes, yes. Again, yeah, this is not an area of my expertise, but there's this movement afoot to have um, psychologically safe workplaces, and right. um, and that's a requirement f for employers of a certain size. And so I know I've been hearing that talked about a bit. I'm not an expert in that area, but that's something that um, is becoming m m more of a concern. I see people talking about that. Right, yeah, no, I, I think definitely um, definitely something that social workers are, are also aware of, of the, um, with the, all the advocacy that we've had around uh, mental health and with, uh, you know, bringing all the campaigns that we've been part of to eliminate stigma, that then along with those kinds of campaigns that are, you know, um, more social justice focused campaigns, that as soon as we start eliminating that stigma, more and more people are going to be coming forward and requiring those services, and we're going to need ways to provide people with those services. So that some of those, um, some of those kinds of trends that we're seeing are, are reactions to that, that people are, are, are more readily um, seeking and offering help. So. That's very interesting. 
I, so this, this is a question about choosing your in, insurance provider as a small employer, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's, it's two-pronged. It's asking, are there Canadian trends in insurance? And is it better to engage a Canadian insurance company? Does that make a difference? Well, it's only Canadian companies that offer insurance in Canada. There are no American companies that offer insurance in Canada. Okay, so no like umbrella kind of organizations like that. In fact, there's some Canadian insurance companies own U.S. affiliates or own, okay. own companies in Asia, et cetera, but there are no American companies that offer insurance in Canada, amazingly enough. It might have to do with legislation, et cetera, but there isn't any that I know of. Right, wow. But I will That's say that employers typically choose on price. So whoever can give them the benefits they want at the lowest price is who they pick. Right. That's why I come back to that competitiveness between um, um, cost, right, is making sure it's low enough to be competitive and high enough to make a profit. Right. Yeah, no, always the, uh, always kind of the issue that we come up against in, in every aspect of our work, be it macro or, or micro, it's always this, those bureaucratic price issues. Well, that, that takes, that is, I think I asked, all of the questions in my queue. So I was I guess I'm wondering, Suzanne, if there's is there anything about the way about the questions that came in that makes you feel that there's a part you should clarify or that you wanted to go into more depth on? Well, I mean, you know, I understand that there might be social workers that aren't covered under certain plans. And I think what, as an organization, is trying to determine where those exist and, and are they centered in as I said, under certain carriers or certain type of employers. Um, you know, uh, the other thing that I can say that just from um, some personal experience with family members is the long wait times to get mental health services, and especially in, in, in so many different situations, is that I, I mean, I personally see the value of uh, adding additional uh, coverage or access uh, for people. So, um, as I said, really trying to get to the crux of who isn't offering and why. And so if it's specific insurance companies, there's only about 25 insurance companies in Canada. So although it, it wow. is a big task, it's not impossible to tackle. And then determining, huh. you know, if, if, if that's the case, but then they might say, oh, yeah, you, you know, employers can choose to add social workers. You know, it's up to them. Then creating that sort of uh, awareness to say, you know, you can choose this. Why wouldn't you choose this? And, and sort of building the case of why you'd also want to cover social workers as well as other mental health practitioners. So to me, there's some steps you can take. Um, but, yeah. I, you know, again, today was an education piece, not a research piece, right? So we'd have to talk about how you can do that. But it's it's not impossible. It's not like there's thousands of insurers. That's, no, that's very, very good to know. Um, one thing that's jumping to mind for me is um, – is I guess asking our members because this for for us too like us too it's um it's anecdotal right like for us too this mm. this whole camp asking you to do this for us was just based on the fact that we get pretty frequent calls from people asking what they can do and we can tell them sort of basically like you know try to tell the employer why you're valuable download our brochure and, and hand it out when you need to here's some tools to better explain why social work. Uh, is valuable and should be included in those plans. Um, but something we're not doing is asking anyone to report back in any kind of a formal way or in any way at all on when they encounter a big employer that doesn't have it covered. Right. And again, is it is it because social workers specifically or, as I said, like getting down to that sort of Gathering, gathering data, right, to understand the problem, right. So I did this once in cancer, right, and so uh, when we actually, we actually did it, we actually did through a survey monkey. We kept collecting this, and we sort of said, is it because the patients um, don't have cancer coverage, or is it because this this cancer drug is normally supplied in a hospital? Like, so questions to ask to figure out what the problem really was. Right, and then we were right. able to do a summary almost by insurance carrier and say the problem seems to be here at this particular company or this particular situation. So as I said, you can get nuance and you you can um, what do they call it crowdsource data <laughs> from your yeah membership. yeah 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 big data. No, this is definitely some this has definitely given uh, me tons of food for thought. 
in terms of what we can be doing, um, you know, on our organizational level, and, and hopefully too, it's been it's given uh, you know the individual members who are working on the front line, who are in private practice or in, in clinical work, um, some ideas of of how they can they can better approach and advocate for themselves. And I'll just re reiterate again too that the, for those of you who may have tapped in late and who missed the first couple minutes of the of the presentation, there are. Um, there are some resources on the bottom left-hand side of your screen that the brochure that I was talking about uh, that we, whenever we go to any meeting, that's what we hand out with whatever uh, social justice piece we're advocating for too. So that's available for download. There's a great fact sheet from the British Columbia Association of Social Workers that also sort of talks about those issues. Um, and then this is today's slide decks. And I have another, oh, and then some people are just commenting that as I was saying this on the phone, people are now offering me up resources to help. So people are saying BC has data on major employers who don't have social work coverage. So uh, there are definitely this is a uh, obviously this is a great conversation to have had um, to get these kinds of things uh, top of mind and get the resources that we that we need. So thank you hmm. so much, Suzanne. I'm glad to be able to help. Yeah. So I guess I, I mean there's no problem with ending um, a couple minutes early, but. Uh, just to sum up, is there anything that's like a that's like so important that it's the, it's the take home point that you want to leave us with? Um, I think the take home point is is that um, an insurance company wants to get as many clients as they can, and if uh, if the client says they want social work coverage, they'll provide it. So ultimately, it's really up to the employer if it doesn't exist today to ask for it. And so I think that's the bottom line is is that. I don't think anybody would prevent an employer from adding it unless it wasn't a licensed practitioner. So I think that at the end of the day, the coverage is available. It's, it's the employer deciding to know to ask for it and be willing to pay for it. That was, right. That's always my take-home point is that, it, it, you know, no insurer is going to say, oh, no, you can't add social work. Right. Right. It's a... Uh... It's knowing how to sell ourselves better uh, and who to sell ourselves to. And for that, the piece about the uh, plan advisors, I think, has been um, invaluable. Uh, and and that, that's the work that we need to be doing here at CSW with the help of our partners. So, no, this has been awesome in terms of, of education. I think people found it really valuable. Um, and I'm, I, will, uh, I will say a huge thank you to you, Suzanne, and a huge thanks to the audience for how engaged you all were. This is probably one of my most um, engaged webinars that, uh, that I've moderated so far, so that's awesome. Um, and we will uh, see you at the next one. Take care. <laughs>